I want to continue um, speaking on what I spoke about the last time we were together and I had the opportunity to share. When I spoke about active faith, our faith in action being lived out through good works and the burden of the Lord that is moving our congregation, that is compelling our congregation to step into new things in God and a new direction that he is birthing in our hearts. And I want to continue with that and I'm going to be uh, sharing a series of messages. There'll be three messages this week, next week, and then culminating on uh, Easter Sunday morning of created with purpose. I say it all the time because the Lord so often is so gracious and merciful to confirm what he wants to say, but no one other than my wife and the other pastoral staff was aware of what I was going to share this morning. Um, We had announced for the most part, that I was going to begin speaking on a music series, which I am going to do, but that will be starting right after Easter because we want to have the opportunity to move from one week quickly into the next because the music series, Every Truth Builds on an, uh, uh, the Truth from the, the week prior. So we, they'll be much closer in succession. But Philip this morning did not know what I was going to be sharing and he summarized my sermon in the prophetic unction and flow that the Lord gave him. The title that's at the top of my page is Created with Purpose. Created with Purpose. This message has been growing and burning, percolating in my heart for about three and a half years. And brothers and sisters, the essence of it is simply this, that there is a God-inspired restlessness. There is a God-inspired dissatisfaction that burns in all of us unless we are doing what God created us to do. This society is one of the most unhappy dissatisfied societies. It's amazing how over and over and over in the past weeks and the months leading up to where we're at right now, how there has been one suicide after another after another of people who in the world's eyes and in the the atmosphere of the culture that we live in should be highly satisfied. People who have reached the pinnacle of their craft or of their career or of their sport and are taking their lives because they are so unsatisfied and hopeless. I trust that there is birthed in you a restlessness, a dissatisfaction that says there has to be more. There has to be more of God's anointing. There has to be more of God's power. There has to be more of who God is than what I am presently walking and living in. We may at times push that impulse and that restlessness down. We might try to ignore it. We might try to cover it up with other activities. But it will always find a way to the rise to the surface of our hearts. And in times of quietness, maybe in the middle of the night when we awake or when no one else is around and we're driving for an extended period of time and our mind begins to settle on really where am I at and what am I doing and who am I? That restlessness begins to stir and says there has to be more to this life in Christ. God has called us to be people who when he moves upon our hearts begins to stir us, we do what we see before us. I act, faith in action. And we asked ourselves this question, what does Jesus look like? What does Jesus look like? And do I look like Jesus? As a follower of Jesus, is my aim, my aspiration to look like him, to act like him, to speak like him, to hear like him, to have a heart that's moved like his heart? Do I really love him enough 
to do what the Holy Spirit said to us this morning in the prophetic, do I really love him enough to obey him? Over the next three services and sermons, the man of greatest purpose and greatest destiny is going to be our pattern and our example, culminating, as I said, on Easter Sunday, and that man is Jesus, the Son of God. If there was ever a human being who lived on the earth who had purpose and destiny and was laser-focused on what that purpose and destiny was, it was Jesus, the Son of God. If you'll turn with me this morning to the main text that will launch us into what I feel the Lord wants to share with us this morning and wants to burden our hearts with, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is the writings of the disciple Luke, and there's a lot of information there about the birth and the events surrounding Christ's birth the events surrounding his um, dedication. But I want to focus this morning for just a few moments on Luke chapter 2, verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, speaking of those who were looking on as he asked and listened. And his mother said to him, So why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And he said to them, why do you seek me? Do you not know? That word know in the Greek is, could be translated appreciate. Do you not appreciate? Do you not understand that I must be about my father's business, that I must be involved in my father's interests? One commentary speaking about that section translates it this way. Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing, speaking of Mary and Joseph. And Jesus replied, In my father's house, where my father's work is done, there ought I to be busied. Did you not know this? It's very interesting about this phrase and and these words of Jesus. These are the first recorded words of Jesus the Messiah that he ever spoke. He obviously, he was 12 years old, he had spoken many words and said many things. But what was recorded for us by the Holy Spirit's desire was these first words of Jesus. Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? That I should be where my father's work is done? That I should be involved where my father is interested? And these words, this phrase, this question becomes the basis and the foundation for the rest of the life and the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Everything he does from this point forward is based on this realization that he said to his parents, do you not know I must be about my father's business? And the, thing that, the things that we can glean from this as we read these words and we hear this first uttered phrases from the mouth of Jesus are what I call the building blocks of destiny. The building blocks of destiny. Knowing I am created with a purpose and a God-created destiny. For Jesus to be able to say these words and to be able to tell his parents about his earthly ministry and his focus, he had to know three things. First of all, he had to know who he was. 
He had to understand that he was the son of the living God. For him to be able to say, I must be about my father's business, he had to understand that he was the son of God. Secondly, he had to know why he was here. Not only who he was, but why he was placed here. Thirdly, not only did he know who he was, did not, not only did he know why he was here, but he knew he had a job to do. These are what I phrase the building blocks of destiny. I would encourage you this morning to take some notes. I would encourage you to take out your phones and turn on your cameras because I'm going to move quickly, but there are some things in these slides that I don't want you to ever forget. I feel that the Holy Spirit is breathing upon us as a congregation and he's about to open doors before us and opportunities before us. And as we were singing this morning, that is certainly what I believe the Holy Spirit would have us respond. Lord, take my life. Here it is. Just like Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. But we have to find out who we are, why we are here, and what we are supposed to do. Because God has a plan. He has a special assignment. He has a job for you to fulfill. And it cannot be done by your own strength. One of the ways we know that God has given us his plan and his assignment is when we look at it, we recognize, I cannot possibly do this in my own strength. I've said to you before the phrase that if we are not dreaming dreams in God that, that startle us, that frighten us, that astound us, then we're not dreaming big enough. We're not dreaming God-sized dreams. And his plans and purposes and the things that he wants us to do, we cannot accomplish them in our own strength. We will need the power, the enabling, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 if there's a secondary text this morning, it is this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You did not decide to chase after the Lord, to seek after him, to serve him. He found you. He sought you. He moved upon you. No man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him, Jesus said. And he's the one who enables us to serve him and to run if we will yield. This gift of God is not of your works, verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I hope that you've been asking at some point in your life these questions because these are the elemental questions of our human existence. Try, science tries to answer them a whole host of different ways. But God has the very answers to these questions that you and I have asked. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? God's creation, when he began to move upon this earth that was without form and void, God's creation was guided by intention. It had an objective. He wasn't just inventing on the fly. He had a purpose, and it was crowned with that purpose, with the reason and the point of what he was trying to accomplish. It's an amazing thing when you uh, read fictional books. I, I, when growing up, I loved to read, and because of uh, the current busyness of my schedule, my reading compared to what it was when I was a teenager and a, a young adult is minuscule. Um, I love to read at night. I remember being a teenager and uh, all of us kind of, the house shut down and everybody went off to bed and I shared a room with my two brothers and I remember hiding under the covers with a flashlight and just reading for hours and hours, two, three in the morning, devouring literature. And one of the interesting things about fictional books is that so very often they have a storyline of a creation turning against its creator. A lot of modern day movies have that same kind of a uh, theme moving through it where the creation turns against the creator. Machines, how many of you have seen this kind of theme in movies, right? That the machines 
turn against humanity and there's this battle between the machines and humanity. There's the battle between artificial intelligence and the one who created the artificial intelligence. Not just movies, but TV themes and all kinds of fiction books. As far back as the Swiss inventor who took parts of, of bodies and put them to get together and created Frankenstein, who eventually turned against his creator. This has been a theme. The creation turning against the creator. And in many ways, brothers and sisters, God's own children reflect this theme. Every single one of us here this morning in some area of our hearts reflect this theme. Because in many ways we find that we're living for ourselves and not for our creator. In many ways we find that we are seeking more after what we want and what we crave and what our inward desires are more than what is on God's agenda, what's on God's heart, what's God's will and purpose for us. And we heard this morning in the prophetic, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Because of reflecting this theme of turning against our own creator, we see all kinds of things that this leads to in our world. It leads to depression. It leads to hopelessness. It leads to addictions. It leads to divorce, emptiness, craving to be someone other than who we are. That's a major problem in the world that we live in. It's what drives all the fads, not just for clothes, but for hairstyles and conversation and music, trying to be someone other than we are. So we see the cult of celebrity that has arisen, not just in the United States, but it's all over the world. When we are doing missionary work in the Philippines, we see the cult of celebrity that was somewhat birthed in the United States, but now has spread abroad. Trying to look like the person that we see on TV, trying to act like the person we see in the movie, trying to be somebody other than who we are. And not only is there a cult of celebrity, but there's the cult of social media, trying to look like someone who we are not. Just do a quick thumb through the apps on your phone. Go to the iTunes store and you'll see how many apps there are that will allow you to take a photo of yourself and then change how you really look. I'm going to say some things today, brothers and sisters, that is going, going to convict us. I've often said to the Lord, Lord, may it always be that at times when I'm in your presence, at times when I'm sitting under the hearing of your word, that I feel the power of your conviction. I've seen in my life serving the Lord, I've watched in Christianity as people get tired of sitting in the pew and squirming under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So they squirt out to run to another place where maybe the message is not so convicting. And if it starts to get convicting there, then they find another church where maybe the message is not as convicting as the previous. The cult of celebrity and of social media trying to let the world around us have a vision and an idea of somebody who we are not, making our lives look more glamorous than they really are. I've known of people who I intimately knew their life and the reality of where they were living, but if you looked at their social media account, their Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, Snapchat, you would think it's the greatest family with the greatest attitudes and actions and love and atmosphere. But when you find what's under the surface, it's all make-believe. Why do we do these things? One man has stated it so clearly. He said that when you look at many Christians today in God's church, they live with such an empty hole in the middle of their lives that you could drive a semi-truck through it. Is that you? Is that the whole, the restlessness that's in the center of your being? 
Why is that there? Why is that there? It's because we fail to comprehend why we were created and by whom we were created. Let me say that again. We fail to comprehend why we were created and who created us. God's kingdom is the theme of the entire Bible. His rule and his authority, his truth, his glory, covering the entire earth, that is his ultimate purpose, that is his ultimate goal. One of the greatest prophecies of all of the scripture is that one day the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord is simply his character, his nature, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That the glory of the Lord will be so present, so visible, so manifest that it will have the depth of the waters that cover the sea. And as this theme runs through the entire Bible, a second theme to that is this, that you and I have been called out of another kingdom and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son and we are now citizens of the kingdom of God. Of God, that we are to know what God's kingdom is and how it should control our lives. And it should be clear that we have a purpose and we have meaning because of that kingdom. We have a role to fulfill. You know, when you set out to bake something, you start to assemble a bunch of different ingredients. I've started to enjoy cooking more as my kids have kind of disappeared out of the house, and I like to experiment. And right now we're in the middle of remodeling our kitchen, so we don't even have a stove, so the experimentation has come to an end. But when you begin to bring your baking ingredients together or your cooking ingredients together, if you're like me, I try to do it, uh, everything all assembled at once. And so laying before me are little bowls and different things with ingredients. And if you were to take those individual ingredients, those little tiny cups of maybe a tablespoon of baking soda and dump it into your mouth and start to chew on that or grab a teaspoon of rosemary and pop it in and start to eat. If you were to take any of these ingredients, for instance, even the ingredients that you would put into your delicious baked goods, cinnamon all by itself, flour all by itself, they wouldn't taste very good. But when you measure them out, you mix them together with intentional purpose and you put them in the heat of the oven and allow it to bake to perfection, how irresistible those ingredients become. For we know, Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. God wants to take the good, the bitter, the seemingly confusing and hurting, all of the ingredients that make up the life that you and I live individually. He wants to put them together in his extraordinary plan for our lives and blend them and and meld them and work through them to create something in us that will become irresistible to those around us. By God's grace, I'm trusting that you will understand by the end of our time together today that God intentionally created you. He created you for a specific purpose. And when you walk in that calling, it will bring true joy, true satisfaction, true fulfillment. You will find the personal satisfaction of doing what you were created to do. God created you with an intention, and God created you with a purpose. We read that in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is an interesting word. It's taken from a Greek word. It's spelled P-O-I-E-M-A, poema. 
And that's where we get our English word poem. We are his workmanship. We're like his crafted poem where God sat down with intention and with purpose and began to plan the stanzas and the rhymes, the rhythm, the development of a life that one day would be yours. It was done with intentionality. It was done with purpose. It was done with forethought. It was done with planning. You are not some random conglomeration of cells and organisms that just happened. You are God's workmanship. God made you intentionally. Your personality, your looks, your passions, your skills. Just think of the different personalities represented here this morning. The personalities represented in your own family, just among your parents and your siblings, your children, your grandkids. The looks, the varied looks when you go throughout the earth, God chose the way you look. And that's a whole other topic of embracing how God made us to look. When I was growing up, I was positive that God had created me to be six foot three. I don't know why I chose that height, but I decided that that's what I was created to be, six foot three. It's the perfect height to be a, a good athlete and a good basketball player and dominant on the field of sports. And when I hit my growth spurt in junior high and high school, I was convinced that it was going to just keep on going, and I creeped forward bit by bit, upwards, changing clothes because the pants no longer fit. And I got pretty close to six foot, and then it all stopped. And I wondered... Lord, why am I not six foot three? I'm positive that's what you created me to be. Our looks, things as silly as that, the color of our hair, the color of our eyes, the color of our skin, the shape of our body, the size of our feet, the shape of our nose, our ears, our hair or our lack of hair. That was all decided beforehand. All of these things God intentionally chose for you and they work with the plan that he has for you. And I want you to catch this this morning. Not only did he give us skills and talents and personality and characteristics, but he even allowed our imperfections. Those things that we see as weaknesses, God says, I want to take those and I want to use them. God dreamed a dream for you, and his purpose involves you having a kingdom effect on the sphere of your influence. His plan for you is that you would have a kingdom call, and that call would spread out and touch everything that you influence. God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and they will rule. They will have dominion. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule. And he began to tell them, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. Psalm chapter eight picks up this theme as the psalmist cries out in verse four, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him or that you give him attention or take care of him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him, listen, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. God had an original intention, image and likeness. We should look like God and we should act like our creator God. And he had an original purpose that we should have dominion under God's authority. We have no authority, we have no dominion unless it comes from God. We can try to. It's become one of the horrible things of the world we live in and it's been there since the beginning of creation 
this desire and this bent towards having power and authority over others. We see it so clearly in our political arena right now. The desire to have authority and power and rulership over others at any cost. They'll say anything, they'll do anything, they'll act any way as long as, and I'm speaking of both parties this morning, they stay in power. They decide what we do, how we speak, how we think, how we learn, and the list just goes on and on. I read of this week of a Christian commentator and blogger in England who in a debate with a woman who has a, what has been termed a transgender child, which there is no such thing, she referred to the child by its biological gender. It was born a boy. And they have taken that footage and that interview and now the police want to bring her in for questioning because she would dare to reference a child by its quote-unquote wrong pronoun. I'm trusting that that doesn't come to America. But if certain people get the ability to rule and have authority over us, sadly, it will come here as well. I loved what my daughter showed me this week. She had a picture of Chuck Norris. How many of you know Chuck Norris? Is that the young people know Chuck Norris? I don't know. I might date those of us who are a little older. <laughs> it had a picture of Chuck Norris, and next to it, it said, I was once a man trapped in a woman's body, and then I was born. <laughs> if you follow God's lordship, not only will you function under his authority and your influence will touch the sphere of your life. If you follow his lordship, he will also give you everything you need so that you can do his will, that you can follow his purpose. So many Christians today find their lives or even brothers and sisters' aspects of their lives. It's easy to look at others and, and think, oh, I... I see how the world rules their life and how they're so influenced by the passions and the, the influences of the generation and culture around us. But so often, we are ruled by the world around us in different aspects of our lives. Maybe in not every area, but in different aspects of sphere of our lives. Many Christians are ruled by the conduct and the ideas and the thought process of the world around them instead of, listen, instead of, ruling the sphere around you with godly influence. Young people, this can happen in the environment of school and friendships. It can happen for us as adults in the area of, of the workplace where we allow the influence of the world around us to begin influencing us to act like and look like and talk like and dress like the world around us. Instead of letting our godly influence permeate the rulership and the kingdom of God flow from us to the world around us. Living out our purpose means fully developing and maximizing and maturing as who you are called to be. Developing the person that is you. Because you are rare. Whether you realize that or not, the world really works hard and our culture really works hard to take us and to cram us into certain molds. And they tell you that when they're cramming you into that mold that you're actually becoming a real individual. There's this huge craze right now with tattoos. And you're really an individual if you start to cover your body with tattoos and yet everybody else is doing it. So are you individual and unique? If you're just following what everybody else is doing? Brothers and sisters, you are rare. The truth is this. There is only and there will only ever be one you. There is only and there will ever only be one you. Knowing that frees us from trying to look like and be like and act like someone else. 
You don't need someone else's skills. You don't need someone else's purpose. You don't need someone else's personality because God created you to be rare. Only one you will ever exist in this universe. Not only are you rare, you are special. You are a king's child. And knowing that will change your life. Knowing that you belong to the king of the universe and you are his son and his daughter will change your life. It will change how you act. It will change how you think. It will change how you talk. It will change how you walk. It will change how you live. You will live differently because you are different. Someone said, and I love this phrase, you are not an off-the-rack you. You are a custom-tailored you. Not only are you rare, not only are you special, you are valuable. Catch this this morning because it applies to every single person who's sitting here. Some in greater measure than others. Please listen. The things that people have said about you in your past no longer matter. The things maybe your parents said to you, or your siblings, or your grandparents, maybe teachers. I've heard the horrible accounts of teachers saying to students, why can't you just catch this? What's wrong with you? Are you dumb? I knew somebody who in the latter years of their life was still carrying around that hurt and wound from a teacher. Friends, supposed friends, acquaintances. Some of you are sitting here and you still remember being a little child and some other little child decided to let you know that maybe your nose was too big or your ears were too big or your face looked funny or you talked funny or you walked funny. And here you are, 30, 40, 50 years later, still carrying around the baggage of what someone said to you. I want to tell you in Jesus Christ, the things that were said to you in your past no longer matter. God has already said you are his workmanship. You are his handicraft. You are his masterpiece. You are the poem that he intentionally and purposefully began to create. And he sees not what others see and what others have said about you. He sees what he can make of you. Because Psalm chapter 139 says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God does not see the problems, the instabilities, the areas of weakness. God looks at you and he sees the potential That is there if we will simply say to him, Lord, take my life, make my life what you want me to be. Not only are you rare, special, valuable, you have a name. Each of us has a natural name in this life. And some of us, our name might mean something wonderful, and for others, it might mean something horrible. Remember Jabez? He was given a name because he caused his mother pain, and yet he cried out and said to the Lord, Lord, change me. Don't let me cause pain. Jacob cried out when he was wrestling with God for a blessing, and that blessing was he got a change of name, and a change of name is a change of character. Ask God to show to you, to reveal to you what your name is because your name defines who you are. And you are also known. May it be of all of us that when others see us, this is what they say. There goes, insert your name, he or she is God's person. When my mother passed away, we had to come up with a saying for the tombstone. And the grave marker had, has two spots because we bought two grave plots, gra- grave plots. And we had to decide right there on the spot what we were going to put for dad's marker. You talk about a difficult thing. We were all reeling under the shock of my mother going to sleep healthy and strong and excited about what she was going to share with the ladies meeting and then she didn't wake up the next morning. 
And coming up with what to say for her was a difficult thing enough. And then they asked us to do that with dad sitting right there. And we came up with a phrase as we sat there, God's kingdom man. But that's not just for the pastors. That's not just for evangelists or prophets or apostles or teachers. That is supposed to be the name that each of us bears. God's kingdom man, God's kingdom woman. Ask the Lord, Lord, what is my name? One person wrote about this concept, and I want to ask you ladies to listen this morning. Please listen with a heart to receive. I share this that I read out of gentleness. May you grasp it. May it grip you this morning because you are God's masterpiece. As so often is said in weddings, you are the crowning glory of what God created. If man was refined the way the wedding ceremony goes, then woman was doubly refined. One author wrote about being God's masterpiece. Satan does not want you to know that you are a masterpiece with a divinely ordained destiny destiny, because if you do, you will view yourself in a new way. You will naturally change the way you plan, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you dream or treat others or treat yourself, the way you act. They went on, and ladies especially, please remember that a masterpiece is often protected and highly, in highly guarded settings so that people who walk by won't feel free to touch it or grab it or put their hands all over it. A masterpiece is so valuable that it is touched only by the one assigned to care for it, the one who knows how to handle it in a way that respects and retains its beauty and its worth. The way we dress communicates to the world around us. And I encourage you, ladies, to remember that you are God's precious crowning masterpiece. And he has somebody who he has prepared that knows how to love you and respect you. That special one who knows how to treat you like the treasure and the masterpiece you are. Don't allow yourself to be touched and grabbed and looked at all over because of the way you act or dress. I want you to ask some questions today. There will be some at the end of the service for you to take home. But think with me this morning, what are your very own distinguishing and individual characteristics? What makes you you? What is your personality? When and how and doing what makes you feel energized and animated and enlivened? I love the thought of being fully alive. If you can define these things, if you can begin to grasp what those things are, you will find that they are the markers and the signals that point you in the direction of what God's plan and purpose and destiny for your life is. What is your God-given calling? I want to share with you this morning And this is another one of those things for you to either write down or snap a picture of so that you can continue to meditate and think on this. I want to give you the very best definition of purpose or destiny that I have ever run across. Your destiny is the customized life calling that God has ordained and equipped you to accomplish And it's in order that you might bring him the greatest glory and you might achieve the maximum expansion of God's kingdom. The author of that statement is Dr. Tony Evans, who has stated that in his latter years of ministry, the kingdom agenda, the kingdom authority, the kingdom purpose of God has become the culmination of everything God has ever taught him. And he now spends his time in his messages and his writing helping people to understand that you have a customized life calling from God. You have been ordained and equipped to accomplish something in God's kingdom. 
And it falls under the category of giving God the greatest glory that you can achieve in your life and maximizing the expansion of his kingdom by touching and impacting and influencing the lives of others around you. Watching someone who through understanding grasps this kind of concept, embraces it and begins to live it out in their daily life, their purpose and their destiny becomes connected and attached to God's kingdom, awakens something in the eyes and the lives of others who are looking on. I've had the privilege of interacting with men of God at times in my life where when they left and I walked away or moved away or left the service where they were speaking or ministering, something burned inside me that said, I want to have what they have. I want to be near God like they're near God. I want to be on fire for God just like they're burning on fire for God. But we have to understand that we have a kingdom call. Because kingdom life is simply this, the visible demonstration of the complete rulership of God over every part of my life. The visible demonstration. When God is at on the throne of my heart, there are going to be ways of acting and talking and working and moving and living and making decisions that reflect the fact that God is the complete ruler of my life. So very often we have things that jump outside of God's rulership. It may be in, uh, in an, the area of entertainment. It may be in the area of what we discuss and the things we say. It might be in the area of friendships. It could be in the area of who we're going to date or who we think we should marry or where we think we should live or what job we believe we're supposed to have. There should be a visible demonstration that God sits on the throne of my heart and every part of the kingdom of my life is under his rulership. In Jesus' largest sermon, He focused clearly on the kingdom of God, and I'm referring to the Sermon on the Mount. And smack in the middle of this entire sermon about God's kingdom and what kingdom subjects look like and act like, he said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I want to draw out just a few conclusions as we look at that text, that amazing phrase from Jesus. First, the mention of a kingdom, seek first the kingdom, the mention of a kingdom assumes this, there has to be a king. You cannot have a kingdom unless there is a king. Secondly, this portion of scripture says to us in just this small phrase, God will not bless the spread of any other kingdom than his very own. And thirdly, the principle of knowing what your purpose is, what God created you and put you here on the earth for, will put him and his kingdom first in your life. Colossians says, for everything was created by him, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that so that he might come to have first place and everything. Simply put, putting the kingdom of God first means that in every area of my life, I go to him first. I have a question, I ask him first. I have a need, I present it to him first. I need an area of wisdom, I ask him for wisdom. And the Bible says of that particular thing, the Lord gives it liberally and without repentance. Walking in God's purpose and destiny is all about alignment. Recently, I had two vehicles that were having front-end problems. One, when you put the brake on, would dive to the right dramatically, and the worst part of it was one of my daughters was driving it, and I was 
not aware of the problem until I borrowed the vehicle to go somewhere and I put on the brakes and it just about yanked out of my hands and I thought, I can't believe she's driving around with the car doing this. And if you didn't hold on the steering wheel and really keep working with it, it just kept wanting to go its own way. And so I took it in and we replaced the the brakes and we replaced the front end bearings and we replaced the tie rods and all the stuff that's up there. I should know more about it with my dad's love for mechanics, but, and it still was doing it. So then we thought, well, maybe it's the shock. So we replaced the shocks and it still was doing it. Maybe it's the brake line and there's a problem there in the brake line that the fluid isn't functioning correctly and kept messing around and messing around. Eventually they found the problem, but when they were done, that vehicle needed an alignment. And I went and picked up the vehicle and I got in and I started to drive and lo and behold, it drove straight down the road because it had been aligned. And when I put on the brakes, it continued to go the direction it was supposed to go and didn't try to veer off and go in another direction. When something is out of alignment, it changes direction. And if we change direction, we have just changed our destination. And so many people get to the end of their lives the destination of their lives, and they find this, that they've missed the mark, the high calling that we heard about this morning, the prize of high calling of serving God in Christ Jesus. But when you look back across their lives, and if they were willing to be honest enough, they would look at their lives and realize, my life was out of alignment. I refused to align my will, my purpose, my plans, my choices, my words, my destiny, I refuse to align it with the king of the kingdom of God. And so is there any surprise then that the destination is the wrong destination and people end up at the end of their lives discouraged, depressed, sometimes even before they get to the end of their lives. We've all heard of the midlife crisis. What am I doing here? How did I get here? Wasn't there a plan? Wasn't there a purpose? Why do I feel so empty? You did not yield your life to God's kingdom purpose. And if we will, even if we've made messes up to this point, God takes messes and he does what? Miracles. And when people see you and watch God make miracles out of the mess of our lives, when they see us align our will and our way with the creator of the universe, they're going to want to know more about this king and his kingdom. Satan is our greatest warning regarding this kingdom because he started to seek his own kingdom. He began to seek his own agenda. And so very often, people of God do the same. They become consumed with the world. And when we're consumed with our own agenda, when we're consumed with the world, it warps our perspective. It hinders our spiritual growth. It loses God's blessing on our lives. His purpose for us is to seek first his kingdom and he's not going to bless any other kingdom agenda other than his own. God created you for his purpose and his plan and to expand his kingdom and he will not assist you. Listen to me this morning. He will not assist you in any other program. He's not going to align himself with you. And if you're walking through life and you feel like over and over and over, you smack up against problems and difficulties, it may be time to stop for a little while and do the front end adjustment and align your life with the purpose of God. That doesn't mean that life is going to be a bed of roses. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be trials. But what it does mean that is in those trials, in those heartaches, in those confusing times, you will have the peace that passes all understanding. You will have the confidence that God knows what he's doing and he's going to bring you through. Instead of walking in confusion and heartache and depression and discouragement and hopelessness, God created you for his purpose and his plan and that is that your sphere of influence would expand his kingdom and he will not assist you if you're working on any other kingdom. So I challenge you today with this challenge. Alter one thing 
in your life today. And watch that one alteration, that one correction, shift everything else. What is that one thing from here forward? From today forward, make the decision to put God first in everything. In your life, in your sphere of influence. And please catch this, not because he is appealing to you to do so. The prophetic again this morning was so powerful. Don't make this change. Don't surrender to the lordship of God's kingdom because God is, you have this idea that God is pleading with you to do so. As his kingdom subjects, he commands us to do so. He demands it of us. As we we heard this morning, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. My significance and my importance come from this. A calling presupposes that somebody is calling me. The calling presupposes there's a caller, just like the kingdom assumes that there has to be a king. You cannot discover, listen to me, you cannot discover your purpose and destiny apart from God. He fashioned you. He saw you before you were born, the Bible says. He has set you apart for himself. He has chosen you. And your purpose and your destiny is bound to your creator. You will never feel more alive than when you are carrying out the destiny that was specifically designed for you. The best example I can give you is one that I've given you before. I love the sun. I love the heat. When it hits 95 degrees in Michigan, I think to myself, we are having perfect weather. I love flip-flops. If there's any shoe that I will, if I can't go barefoot, which is my main preference, if I have to have a shoe on my foot, my favorite shoe is a flip-flop. I love other languages. You will never feel feel more alive than when you are carrying out the destiny specifically designed for you. And part of my destiny, part of my purpose is that God gave me a missionary heart. And lo and behold, how does that line up with my love of the heat and flip-flops and t-shirts and shorts and languages? And those of you who have been with me in the Philippines have told me over and over, When we watch you in the Philippines, you seem like you're fully alive. Now, that doesn't mean that I negate all of my other responsibilities. We have to do things that don't always make us feel fully alive. When I'm preaching a sermon and the Holy Spirit is moving through my life as a channel, I feel fully alive. But before I can preach that sermon, I have to do something that I really do not like to do. Recently, I read a quote from Max Lucado. They said, how have you become such a prolific author? How do you write a book? And he said, it's very simple. You put your rear end in a chair for a very, very, very long time. (laughs) And when it's time for me to put a sermon together, I feel like it's the hardest thing for me to do, to put my rear end in the chair for a very, very long time. So not everything in our lives is going to make us feel like every moment of every day, every breath that we breathe, we are fully alive. But God has called you to a purpose and to a destiny, and part of that will energize you and animate you to the point where you say to yourself, I've never felt more alive and more useful for God than I am right now. If you choose not to pursue and not to live in God's purpose for you, you will spend your entire life wishing, listen, wishing you were someone else or trying to be someone else or trying to be something that you're not. I love the phrase, I've used it often with people that I've met, that have somehow, by God's grace, surrendered to the kingship, the lordship, the kingdom of God. And I'll say this about them. You know, they're comfortable in their own skin. They're not trying to look like. They're not trying to act like. They're not trying to talk like. They're not trying to be like someone else. They found out that God chose them, purposed them, planned them, and they've become happy doing what God has called them to do. I want to give you a truth statement this morning. If you are not happy, listen, if you are not happy with who you are, young people, please 
perk up for just a few more minutes. If you are not happy with who you are, you have not yet discovered who God created you to be. Because you have a personalized purpose. Think of Esther. She was Jewish, the Bible tells us, and she was beautiful. And God took these two specific characteristics. It says she was an extremely beautiful woman, and it tells us that she was of Jewish descent. He took these very specific characteristics and used them to usher her in to her destiny. Because of her beauty, she found the affection of the king and was brought in as his wife, his queen. And because she was Jewish, she responded to the call and she became the savior of her people. Mordecai reminded her, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so what are the applications of your personalized plan and purpose of God? If you are determined to accomplish God's intended purpose for putting you on earth, you will work at and you will learn to regard and evaluate everything in your life with God's plan, his kingdom agenda, in the forefront of your mind. It will control your decisions. And you know, this is not just for pastoral staff. This is for everyone who is called into subjection to the kingdom of God. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his son, and he goes, the scripture goes on in 1 Corinthians and says this in, verse, in chapter 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. Husband, wife, son, daughter, construction worker, company CEO, factory employee, office worker, homemaker, doctor, student, And the list just goes on and on. Everything you do, listen, everything you do in any capacity has eternal kingdom value and has significant influence. Esther's purpose in life greatly impacted countless lives of others. Pastor Bob this week was at a, with some of the folks from church here at an abortion pro-life event where ministry here in Michigan will encourage you to get involved. There's information on the back. Last year, we're able to save 98 women and their children. They were able to keep them from having an abortion. And listen, abortion is not wrong just because it kills and takes away a life. It's also wrong because it steals away the purpose and the destiny of that life and every single person that life would have touched. Because of Esther, the scripture tells us that instead of the Jews being overpowered, they overpowered their enemies. Instead of being destroyed, the scripture says they destroyed their enemies. Instead of losing their possessions, the scripture says they retained their possessions and took the spoils of their enemies. If you choose to live as a kingdom citizen, fulfilling your purpose and destiny, the people around you will be influenced by God's kingdom and control over your life you will come to realize this, that your life and how you're involved and how you function in your sphere of influence has far-reaching significance and that one of the greatest privileges of a child of God is to be an ambassador of reconciliation, repossessing hell's prisoners and relocating them in the domain of heaven. Someone once made this statement. You are to be a conversation starter about your creator. You are to bring him glory. You may feel useless this morning. You may feel worn out and spent, rejected, unwanted. But your Savior wants to come in. He wants to break you. He wants to melt you. He wants to mold you. You, He wants to fill you your life with his glory and he wants to use you as his own very special opus magnum. That's a musical term for the culmination of an entire life of an artist or a composer, their greatest work that they ever did. 
That's what God wants to turn your life into. For it was you who created my inward parts, the psalmist said. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days are written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Please listen very closely now. God created you with a purpose. It doesn't matter the circumstance of why you were born. Maybe you were born to a a mother who didn't want you. Maybe you were born to a family where a father was not there for you. Maybe you've been told by people that they wish you weren't born. You are not a mistake. There's not a single part of your life, your purpose and God's grand destiny for you that was a mistake. Every part of you was on purpose. And embracing the sovereignty of God, brothers and sisters, does not mean that we believe he causes everything. Everything in my life may have a cause from him, but I think the sovereignty of God is better stated this way. He either causes or allows everything in my life. And if he allowed it, He wants to use it. Even if I don't understand the pain or the confusion or the hurt. When we choose to still love him, when we choose in these times of confusion and areas of hopelessness to love him, and pursue his kingdom purpose, he makes this promise to us. He will cause everything in our lives, whether it's something he caused or something he allowed, to work for our good. Growing up, that scripture was used just so flippantly. All things work together for good. There was even a little goofy song that went with it. I've come to believe that's one of the most profound, beautiful promises of God in all of Scripture. I want to encourage you today as we come to a close to dream God-sized dreams. I've embraced this following statement, I hope, to live it to its fullest. God created all people with a destiny that would blow their minds if they knew what God wanted them to do. God did not bring you into his kingdom so that every Sunday morning you can just come sit in church and be blessed. He brought you into his kingdom because he has a job for you to do. He has a purpose for your life. He has a destiny that he wants you to fulfill. The scripture talks about called, chosen, and faithful in the book of Revelation chapter 17. Do you realize those first two parts, called and chosen, that's God's work. That's the work he does. That's the process he starts. But the third part of that, faithful, is our responsibility. Brothers and sisters, you are body members. And you have a job. 1 Corinthians talks about the body being many having many parts and yet still being one. It talks about the hands and the feet and the eyes and the nose and the ears and the head being Christ. We are kingdom subjects and we have a role and a place in that kingdom. And the Spirit of the Lord is crying out to anyone who will listen in his kingdom, come and join my adventure. Serving God is not supposed to be boring and mundane and drudgery and dull.
I'm going to give you some assignments for next week. Take these questions home with you. Pray about them this week. Think on them. Are you being tempted to or presently are living for yourself? And if so, what areas, what aspects? List some of your distinctive characteristics. In what ways could God possibly use these traits to broaden his kingdom through you? And can you see that these characteristics and traits are suggestions of your God-given purpose? Are you wrestling with putting other things first in your life in place of the kingdom of God? What's taking preeminence? What seems to be usurping the lordship and the kingship of your master? What are these things? What corrections? What alignment do you need to make to the course of your life in order to live in God's kingdom pursuit. Every building has a point where it starts out as a muddy, messy, dirty, empty lot. My brother and I were just talking about that this week. The worst part of any building project is that plowed up, dirty, muddy, empty field. But if you follow the blueprints and you stick to the plans, one day there's going to stand there a finished, beautiful building for all to not only admire, but to enjoy. Brothers and sisters, will you stand with me today? God wants you to turn the reins of your life over to him. And he promises to... Take a life that is surrendered to him. One that says, as we were singing, take my life, Lord, use my life. Make me what you want me to be. He promises that he will take our difficult trials and he'll bring in his answers. Our desperation and our hopelessness will receive his endless supply. The events and circumstances of your life will find that he has a purpose and a plan for you and it will awaken something in you that you never thought could be possible. If you truly want to live your life with lasting, eternal purpose and meaning, then right now you have to start believing by faith that you were created on purpose, and for a purpose. You were meant to do great things for God. You are meant to bring God great and mighty glory. I'm going to ask you to recite with me today in closing two statements. I want you to say them out loud. If you are not a subject of the king, I encourage you to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But if you are a subject of the King and you want to make that alignment adjustment today, you want to put first the kingdom of God, seeking His kingdom above all else, His purpose for your life above all else, and I encourage you to say these statements with me. I will read them one time and then I'll ask you to read them with me. Statements of faith. The first one is, I am a purposeful, intentional creation of Father God. If you want to live under the lordship and the rulership of God's purpose and intention for you, then pray this statement out loud with me right now. I am a purposeful, intentional creation of my Father God. And in Christ, I have everything I need to complete my purpose, fulfill my role, and reach my destiny in the kingdom of God. Read that with me and pray it as a prayer. In Christ, I have everything I need to complete my purpose, fulfill my role, and reach my destiny in the kingdom of God.
Let's bow our heads. Father, you've heard us confess these words of faith before you. Breathe upon us in the name of Jesus. Let the Spirit's power and the Spirit's anointing and the Spirit's grace blow upon these earthen vessels, Lord. Standing here, Lord, are brothers and sisters who have endured much heartache and sorrow and the vicious impact and effect of the kingdom of Satan through words and actions of others. We all stand here, Lord, with areas of inferiority and areas of weakness. But Father, even as we heard this morning in the prophetic, you have declared to us that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. You are not confused, though we might be confused. You are not limited, Lord, though we are limited. And Father, we bring to you these vessels today in the name of Jesus, in believing faith. Lord, we do want to act with works of faith. We do want to live lives of excitement as we pursue the kingdom of God. We do want to be fully alive in Christ as you work through us and use us. Even as we heard prayed out today, Lord, that you would help us to impact and touch the lives of those around us, giving us your heart and your mind and your love for others. So Lord, we align ourselves right now with the particular purpose and plan you have for our individual lives. And as we move forward through these sermons, Father, continue to stir us and direct us. And at the end, may we find and know that not only do you have a purpose for us, not only do you have a, a target and an aim for us, but you will help us to accomplish it, Lord. And we can glorify your name in ways that we have never imagined if we will just yield to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, we soften our hearts. We do not harden them. We soften them right now to your word. Stir us, Lord, as we meditate on these questions this week and as we answer these questions, Lord, use them to stir our hearts and to captivate us and to help us to love you more, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.